So now it's my similar great pleasure to introduce the second speaker, Alessandra Fadjian. Uh, she's Professor of Applied Economics, Director of Social Sciences and Vice President for Research at the Grand Sasso Science Institute in Italy. She's co-editor of the Journal of, of Legal Science, among many other things. Her research interests lie in the field of regional and urban economics, demography, labor economics, and economics of education. She has a huge number of publications on topics such as migration, human capital, labor market, creativity, and local innovation and growth. In the recent ranking of the top 100 regional scientists, she, is, she was ranked 19th. Today her topic is harnessing artificial intelligence for regional eco-innovation, a pattern-based analysis of European region's green tech specialization. The floor is yours. Thank you. First of all, I shortened the title because there was a, too much uh, to read. So I said, OK, let's shorten the title. The second thing I want to say before I start is that this is the very first time in, throughout my career that I'm the very last speaker in a conference. And I didn't think any of it until two days ago. I don't know if I can see her in the audience, but at one point, somebody told me, oh, it's a great spot to be last in a conference because you're going to be the last one that people are listening to before flying back home. So they might be thinking about your presentation <laughs> while they're traveling back home. That's a way to go to make me a little bit anxious about my presentation now. Um, so I want to thank the organizer of the conference for having invited me here uh, today. This is actually my first Joino conference, but I promise it won't be the last um, because I really truly enjoyed the experience, great people and great quality of the conference. So thank you very much. I'm really grateful for being here today. Uh, this is not actually what I've been doing in the last 20 years or so. It's something a little bit new that uh, started about a year ago with three co-authors. Now, the people that know me a little bit know that I don't like articles with a lot of co-authors. My standard, my maximum is three. And I'm not well known to be a very flexible person <laughs> either. <laughs> so, you know. But this time I was. And so there are four authors. And the reason why there are four authors is because actually half of them are more geo and half of them are more inno. And there is a complete gender equality also in the number of authors. So I thought it was a good balance to strike. Um, right, so I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence and uh, eco-innovation today, as already Bjorn said, said. And it's funny, Neil, I have to tell you, we, we, can you please say to the audience that we didn't see each other and we didn't agree on having the same exact two slides in our presentation? <laughs> and as I was sitting there, I was thinking, OK, great. They're going to notice the difference in the accent more now that I'm actually commenting on the same two slides that Neil is commenting on. But then I thought, OK, they gave me this microphone like Madonna, so I'm going to beat him on the non-verbal communication, because now my hands are free. I'm Italian, and I can actually move my hands as much as I want. It's exactly Ron. You see, uh, <laughs> Ron knows me. I'm actually doing these kind of things all the time. And when I first moved to the UK, they told me it was impolite. And I couldn't do it. So the first presentation I did, I had both pens in both hands, and it was the awful. The first two minutes of my presentation were absolutely <laughs> terrible. And then I said, what the heck? Sorry, I have to move my hands. I'm Italian. It's my nature. There's nothing I can do about that. Anyway, going to something a little bit more serious now, because you know I'm a little bit of a joker and a performer. But there are some times to actually talk about more serious stuff. Uh, when I start doing something, whatever is the topic, I actually first ask myself, why do we care about it? And I do like, as uh, Neil did, to look into, you know, Google. Yeah. Aside from the fact that, you know, we say fuck off Google, but we all use it, right? And it's always very good to have a sense of what are the trending topic. So what I did, I said, okay, I'm doing artificial intelligence. Let's Google artificial intelligence. If you actually do that, you get uh, around 757 million entries. So I would say that it's quite a popular topic. 
I then did the same with eco-innovation, and again, you get around 57 million. And then I said, you know, I, I increased the level of complexity, and I said, okay, let's do artificial intelligence and eco-innovation, and still you get around 11 million entries. So this shows the huge hype uh, that there is nowadays around these uh, terms. Uh, this, you had this as well, right, in the same order. But then you think, okay, is it just a media hype, or actually, the uh, academic community is now also interested in the topic. Well, as you can see, if you look, this is uh, Scopus as well, somewhere, it's <laughs> the same source as well. Um, if you actually look at the papers uh, from 1996 to 2017 that mention the word AI, you can see how it grew exponentially. Right? Look, especially in the last few years, from 2014 to 15 and then 16, the academic community became more and more interested in the artificial intelligence topic. Uh, if you actually look at uh, what are the sub-topics of artificial intelligence, I'm sure you can guess some of them. The most popular one is actually machine learning and probabilistic reasoning, but another very popular one is neural networks followed by some more nuanced uh, terms like computer vision, search and optimization, and so fuzzy system, which is something you mentioned as well, Neil. Okay, so I spent 11 years in the UK, seven in the US, and then I came back to Italy. Well, I went back to Italy because we're not in Italy right now. Uh, and uh, I thought, okay, normally the US are leaders in a lot of things, right? So how is Europe doing in terms of AI, of artificial intelligence? And if you actually look at the uh, patents uh, in Europe, we're not doing that bad at all. So if you look at the absolute number of patents, uh, which are classified as AI in 2013, the absolute number is about 20,000, and there has been a rapidly uh, advanced a rapid advance in this kind of expansion of this technology, so Europe is not doing bad, and if we are comparing Europe with uh, other parts of the world, uh, what, I don't know if it's surprising to you, but you know, I didn't know it was as such when I actually did this slide, uh, Europe is not lagging behind at all. In fact, it's kind of, there has been a, a process of catching up in the last few years, and right now it's almost uh, well, it's on par with the US. So, definitely there is some interest in artificial intelligence and Europe is not doing that bad. In fact, I started looking also at policymakers and international organizations, and what I found is that, for instance, the European uh, Commission writes write for the Horizon 21-27 uh, uh, program, which is you know, the one we are all going to be applying in the next few years, aside, I'm sorry, from... <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> uh, okay, so the European Commission said uh, Europe is a leading force in artificial intelligence research and it's home to 32% of artificial intelligence research institutions worldwide. EU's backing for AI initiative has been growing steadily within, with each long term, blah, blah, blah. And to cut a long story short, for the Horizon Europe 2127 program, the EU has proposed to invest at least 7 billion in AI related research. So, not just the media high, but this is also now becoming highly um, po high policy relevant. But, what is artificial intelligence? I guess we all have a sense of what it is, right? It's one of these concepts that everybody knows what it is, but then when you come to define it, you are not quite sure what it is. Uh, it's kind of a loose term, and right now it's used to describe technologies that exhibit human-like intelligence. So what is funny, actually, is that for 20 years I've done human capital, and now I'm doing artificial intelligence, which is kind of the, the complement to that, right? Uh, it includes things like, as we saw before, machine learning, but uh, uh, auto autonomous robotic and vehicles, computer vision, uh, but also things that are kind of more simple, like the AE enabled traffic light. There are some in the US now, and apparently they are reducing traffic and health, uh, hence uh, improving the kind of you know, air quality and the environment. 
And why is AE different? So I'm not uh, an economist of innovation, I'm a regional economist, but here <laughs> there are so many economists of innovation, all experts on innovation, and I was thinking, okay, but is, isn't AE like any other innovation? Actually, it's not, because it has uh, uh, certain characteristics, uh, idiosyncratic features, if we want to actually say it in a uh, uh, more uh, refined way, uh, that make it different from the other more traditional technology. First of all, artificial intelligence is a general purpose technology, right? So it can be applied to all range of different problems and settings. And then it has also been defined as an invention of a method of inventing. So not, not just you know, doing things in the playbook in a different way, but expanding the playbook. Inventing something that can help you invent more. So in a sense, it is transformative, disruptive, enabling. And when a technology has such characteristics, then the, uh, the economic impact that is expected is quite large. And what is the economic impact? This is now becoming a masterpiece uh, in the literature on uh, IE. Uh, and some of the effect, well, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be the last, so I've uh, heard a lot of uh, people talking about the effect of AE, the substitution of jobs, you know, with humans and job destruction and so on. So definitely the um, economic impact of AE goes on employment and skills, so the replacement of tasks in existing or new occupation. Productivity effect, you hope that AE is helping you being more efficient, but also profitability, firm growth and so on, and many, many other. As I said, you can find uh, all these uh, discussed quite uh, um, extensively in this uh, book, but one thing that this book is not talking about is actually the effect of AE on environmental sustainability. Um, so now people are starting getting into this idea that artificial intelligence might also be very useful in terms of helping us with the biggest problems of today, which is environmental sustainability. Um, there is a report of 2018 by Intel. Okay, there might be some conflict of interest here, but 74% of 200 business decision makers in environmental sustainability that were interviewed agreed that AE would help solve environmental problems. Here is something that I took from Greenpeace, and this is the mention, I don't know if you can see it if it's too dark, but this is the mention of AE in corporate sustainability reports uh, initially, it was a little bit uh, you know, up and down, but then since 2014, you can see there is a peak in mentioning artificial intelligence in this sustainability report. So there is a link, apparently. Uh, so, and this link is not something that other people have not, have not thought about before. We're not the first one talking about the environmental impact of AE. Uh, and especially international organization have actually proposed some uh, uh, interpretation, reports, and so on, on the link between A and eco-innovation and environmental sustainability. For instance, I found this uh, on the uh, World Economic Forum 2018. This is the AE for the uh, Earth Game Changers, and this is an indicative timeline. It's very small, it doesn't really matter, uh, because I just want to show you, for instance, uh, some of the application would include by between 2020 and 2030, something like uh, community disaster resilience, which is something that coming from L'Aquila, which is a city that was struck by the earthquake 10 years ago, is something we are working on, uh, going to fully automated and connected urban transport system in major cities. Uh, the European Commission as well, I've already mentioned it before, it's kind of talking about that as well. This was a report that was called, Can New Tech, like AE, Save Resources and the Environment? Uh, the, the report I've just mentioned, the World Economic Forum report, is the first one that is actually very clearly spelling out some practical application of AE to what they call earth-friendly applications, so earth-friendly AE. 
And so they go from climate change, which is probably you know, the one that everybody's thinking about, to biodiversity and conservation, healthy ocean, water security, clean air, and weather and disasters resilience. I, I know I don't have much time, so I, I had a couple of examples. This is clean air, but I want to show you this one because it's closer to my heart, which is weather and disaster resilience. In L'Aquila at the GSSI, we have a center, together with the computer scientists, mathematicians, and physicists, in fact, that it's kind of going into this direction of AE-powered uh, technology. So we do have drones, we do have sensors for real time, not just flood mapping, but we are actually trying to monitor all sorts of dimension and also in respect to response uh, to uh, possible natural disasters such as earthquake. Yet, Okay, despite the hype and the recognized potential of AE for sustainable development, the impact of AE on eco-innovation is still in its infancy. There aren't very many uh, contributions, as far as we know, that have studied this. And the regional dimension is also overlooked. So this is where con our contribution was trying to kind of give... Uh, 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 entered. So, uh, the aim of our contribution is, in fact, to explore the link between the AE and the innovation at the regional level, in order to answer questions such as, does the region endowment of AE actually help their green transition? Or can regional AE policies, such as the one that you would find in Industry uh, 4.0, be actually considered an effective instrument of regional environmental sustainability? Could AE and environmental policies better talk to each other at a regional level? Uh, the data that we used are a combination of two data sources, and we looked at both the NATS2 and NATS3 uh, level. The data are from the EPO patents, the OECD RegPAT, and, and we combined that with some features of the regions that were coming from the European Regional Database. We looked at a period that goes from 1982 to 2013, and we aggregated actually the data also for numerosity, in eight four-year period. And the geographical coverage is the usual AU, 28 countries, which you can see in here. The technological coverage, well, we use the cooperative patent classification, the CPC, as you all call it, um, classes at four digits. So for instance, you know, if we are looking at uh, green technology, YO2, climate change, and so on. The final sample had 482,310 three CPC period observation. Um, the dependent variable that we were interested in was this kind of green technology um, reveal technology advantage, right? So, well, I'm, I'm sure I don't have to explain to you how this is done. For me, as a regional economist, this is pretty much like a location quotient. So if this is above one, it shows that that particular region has an advantage, reveal technology advantage in the green sector. If it was below one, then it does not. And what we did, actually, we dichotomized the variable zero, one to run the model. Uh, the green technology were identified on the basis of green patent code uh, coming from the, you know, these works of the OECD and MTech indicators uh, that they were converted to CPC uh, by Consoli et al. in 2019. Uh, a couple of maps, because I am a regional economist, so this is the green tech specialization. I'm sorry, it's actually light green and, and dark green. We should have thought clearly and have maybe two different colors, but the, the dark ones are actually the regions that had a revealed technological advantage in green technology. And just to give you a sense of how each country was doing, this is the percentage of uh, um, um, nuts tree within each county that had ones, so they had this revealed technology advantage. I was very happy actually to see, being Italian, that Italy is not doing that bad actually, 14.56 uh, compared to the, the leading countries such as Finland or Denmark or, the, um, or Germany. Uh, I thought it was actually a very good result. Our focus variable, it's of course, because we're talking about AE and uh, green innovation, is the stock of AE-related patents. We just use the usual uh, permanent inventory approach in which you actually sum all the stock of AE over time with, of course, a deflating uh, uh, rate. 
Um, and then, of course, we are aware, we base our uh, definition of AE and um, the relevant CPC classes on this contribution that I became very aware that a lot of you are actually working on these and there are other contributions that now we should look at to better maybe refine our definition. But our is the first glandular mapping of AE at NATS3 level, and there has been previous work which was focusing more like on industry 4.0 in general, or at a larger uh, geographical scale like the NATS2. I don't know what I'm doing with time. This is just a map to show the stock of AE patents. The only thing I can say here, because there is no clear pattern really, is that compared to the green technology, because the AE patents are less or fewer, the, the, it's more kind of, you know, scarce, uh, and uh, so it's a little bit more spread out, uh, say, than the green technology. Uh, the explanatory variable. So uh, one other variable that we, of course, had to check for was the technological relatedness. Uh, so based on proximity and uh, the revealed technological advantage, we lagged it. And I'm aware that there is kind of a debate on this, but we decided to actually look at a lagged variable, so to look at the industrial structure, let's say, five years before. Uh, and then we looked at the lagged variable on the dependent variable and on the I stocks. Uh, patent, uh, the usual kind of, you know, size uh, variable, and then, of course, because we are aware that there are a lot of uh, omitted variables in this uh, um, analysis, we had a three-way fixed effect, uh, so to control for year, period, and CPCs. This is the basic uh, baseline empirical specification. I showed you the table of the uh, variables, so uh, the green reveal technology advantage as uh, a function of the lagged one, the stock of AE, the relatedness, and then the controls that I showed you before, plus the three fixed effect and the error term. We estimated it, and the, one, the results that I'm showing you, which are, of course, preliminary, we based it on the linear probability model with three-way fixed effect, but we did logit probit, and at the end, the significance of the coefficient was unchanged. Uh, then we also went uh, into looking at the interaction terms between our variables of interest, uh, starting from green and relatedness, and then uh, to, to basically answer the question, does relatedness reinforce green tech path dependence or not? Green and I stock, does the green tech impact of a benefit from pre-existing green experience, or rather work for the green switch? Uh, then the A stock and the relatedness, does the A attenuate the binding role of related technology? And then the last is the, a three-way fixed effect, which basically is telling you whether the pre-existing green tech of regions affect the moderating role exerted by AE or related technologies for the green tech specialization. Okay, so results. Still preliminary, these are the results. I'm showing you the results at NAT3. Uh, and then, very briefly, I have a table to show you the difference between the NATS2. Uh, green tech specialization is both path dependent and place dependent, and that goes with the previous literature, and it's kind of was expected. But also, uh, relatedness reinforces the path dependence of green tech specialization, which was also expected. Thank God, you know, when it's expected, it's, thank God. <laughs> uh, what we found, though, and I'll comment on this in a second, is that the AE stock, surprisingly, at least to me or to us at the beginning, has a negative and um, significant coefficient. So, right now, it's not as surprising to me as it was when we first saw that, and I'll tell you why. But having said, you know, all the role of AE for uh, green technology and whatever, probably our first expectation would have been to find something that was positive and significant. And in fact, we found the opposite. And what it means is that an unconditional endowment of AE leads regions to prioritize other technologies, not really the green ones. However, if you look at the interaction term, if you are actually focusing on regions that already have a green specialization, then the AE works. Um, 
AE does moderate the role of relatedness. Again, this makes sense because I've just told you well, a few slides before that uh, the AE, it's a GPT, it's a general purpose technology. So this was not so surprising to us. And finally, if you look at the uh, last uh, three-way fixed effect, AE does not attenuate the binding role of relatedness in already green tech regions. So when you actually interact that with the green tech reveal technology advantage, you get results that are the opposite of what you have for the general regions. Uh, well, there are a lot of geographers here, right? And I've been in Southampton in geography department for five years, so this modifiable area unit problem, I know it's, it's always something big. Did, did we get the right scale geographically? So we redid the analysis, which was actually easier at NATS 2 level. And we got the same exact results up to here, but then we actually had different results, non significant. So they were not going in the opposite direction, but they were not significant for the three way fixed effect and the uh, relatedness times AE uh, interaction. And this is a very patriotic map, as you can see, because it's uh, the color of, the, of, of Italy. Uh, I actually uh, I wanted to map. The fixed effect, I've just done it at NAT2 level because it was a little bit quicker than do, uh, do it at NAT3 level and it kind of uh, depicted a clearer picture. Uh, the white ones are the insignificant fixed effect, which means that our model was actually predicting the variable quite well. Yeah, yeah I'm done. Um, and then the, the green one are the significant positive fixed effect, regional fixed effect, and the red one are the opposite, the negative and, and significant fixed effect. So as you can see, there is very much, now I'm into the urban rural core periphery literature, so there is very much a core periphery uh, distinction here in the fixed effect, which actually means that there are some variables that we don't include that uh, are positive are making this region perform better than what our model predicts, and this region perform worse than what our model predicts. And of course, now, you know, we are in the process of thinking about what is it? Institutional factors, human capital, blah, blah, blah. What is it that we can actually put into the model to actually reduce the amount of fixed effect that are actually significant? Okay, preliminary conclusions, because this is by no means uh, a project that it's at the end. We are planning to continue doing it, and I thought it was fantastic to present it here because I could get very good ideas uh, on what we should do next. So the thing that I'm feeling it's the most important thing to say right now is that the relationship between AE and green innovation is probably not as straightforward as you think it is. AE, of course, can be of use and can help with sustainability, but maybe we are not there yet. Is AE green? Is AE brown? Is AE white? Right? So not in technologies that are polluting and that are brown, but not in green technology either. Well, our results seem to say that it's not green yet. And why is that? Right? We have to think about uh, working on the interpretation of this. I'm by no means an expert on AE, but I'm thinking, talking with the computer scientist, that to implement AE technology, you normally need a large amount of data. And that this large amount of data, even historical data, right, you need to have a lot of them, might not be readily available in some, maybe, of the uh, green technology um, industry. Uh, Maybe it's a matter of maturity. And that also takes me back to the fact that you have different results when you are looking at regions that already have a revealed technology advantage in green industries, which means that maybe they do have the maturity, they are into this sector longer, so they have more data. Right? So, but anyway, it's something that we're thinking of uh, and we still don't have an absolute final answer for that. And then another question that I'm almost, you know, I'm almost exploiting you in reverse. Are we missing some very important variable in the kind of economics of innovation literature that we should include? Do we have, for instance, to add to this model, which we are actually planning to do, the, the economic complexity, for instance? And any other suggestion? 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very interesting uh, talk and perfect timing. So we have approximately 10 minutes again for questions, yeah? And there. <laughs> it's you having problem with microphone then. <laughs> I'm going to say this. <laughs> I really uh, enjoy your uh, presentation. Can I two quick reactions? Mm -hmm. One is that in a very recent survey that was just released this January by the US Census, okay. looking at almost a million firms in the US, mm. it turns out that only 2% of the firms are actually really using AI, right? Which means that there has been a lot of investments but firms still don't know how to integrate this into their value chains, which is also <laughs> worrisome. But it's also because we are in a very early stage yet. So that makes me think about how should we be interpreting patent data? And, and per your question, what other variables should we have there? Perhaps we need data on employment as well, because mm -hmm. it's not just about the patent itself, do I also have the employees, the mm -mm. skills, the related yeah. technologies? the production capacity for the AI services. So I guess my reaction is, is it too early to perhaps understand what regions have a comparative advantage mm -hmm. in AI? Do I answer or, or okay. Uh, we kind of had the same discussion about a year ago when we were looking at patents and AI. Uh, and that's the reason why we're actually looking at the AE stocks rather than the AE flows, because otherwise, as you say, you know, we wouldn't have had enough observation to do that. Uh, but as I showed you in the map, it's true. I mean, that, and it's funny because yesterday I was actually in a session in which I was actually highlighting the shortcomings of the patent data, and here I am and I'm using the same. Because the reality is uh, when we came to think about AE, the first measure that came to mind was in fact the patent data. Um, in terms of uh, it is too early, well, there's always kind of a choice uh, in the sense that there are already people out there that are looking at patent and AE uh, uh, with respect to the, the, the relationship with, for instance, green technology. So we thought, okay, we are giving an initial insight in what it is the state of the heart now with the scanned data that we have at the moment. Uh, is it uh, the... the ultimate paper on this and we have the ultimate answer? No, with the limitations that we all know we have. We started painting an initial uh, picture with the idea of improving it. And of course, we might come up with other ways as well. Maybe even looking at, uh, I'm very quantitative. Don't get me wrong, right? But uh, right now, I'm leading a group in which there are a lot of people that do mixed studies, uh, mixed methods, and uh, qualitative analysis. And I'm kind of becoming a little bit more of a fan of looking into some kind of case studies or qualitative analysis. And I don't exclude that we will actually move towards that direction as well to have a better picture of what AE is. I'm absolutely agreeing with you that I don't think the businesses are mature yet to integrate AE properly into their business, at least the majority of them, with some exception. But you're right. You yes. Hello, Alessandra. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Ah, Davide. Ciao. Davide. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much for a great presentation. I don't think it's, it's never too early to raise such great <laughs> questions. Um, when you talk about green technology, you're talking a huge bundle, very different and the very different stages of development. Mm -hmm. um, so you may want to articulate that. If not by area of green technology, yeah. i.e. micro classes, yeah. you may want to think about the life cycle stage. Because some of the te mature technology, yeah. green technology, will probably benefit from AI, which I think je works yeah, as a yeah, general yeah, yeah, technology. Yeah, yeah. Whereas more, maybe less mature, may benefit in other ways, because maybe AI can um, sure, right. complement the explorative or fulfill the f explorative function yeah. they may have. 
Yeah. The good news is that some data on, on that front are available already, so we can be in touch later. But I think the life cycle uh, maybe could be a way to uh, point you know, taken. deal with the diversity in a, in a fashion, in an orderly fashion. Uh, point taken, and thank you for the suggestion, because this is something we hadn't discussed yet, but I think you are absolutely right that we should diversify among the green technology, because not all, all of them are the same and they are very heterogeneous. So. All I have to say is thank you for the suggestion point taken. It goes back to my last. I don't have anything to answer rather than saying we haven't done it yet, but we were uh, definitely taking your suggestion into account. Thank you, Davide. Comment? Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much. The thank press, you. It's the same question for you. And the warning is the same, don't use it on Gorgon Solar. I will use it on uh, Grana Padano, oh, that's which good. is... <laughs> that's good. <laughs> and then I give the floor to uh, Rune for a couple of words of farewell. Yeah, so it's a great pleasure uh, to uh, now close the uh, Geography of Innovation Conference. I wanted to thank you all for coming uh, on this Brexit day uh, to the UK friends out there, I would say welcome to the dark side. <laughs> I hope it has not been uh, too much of a scary experience being here. You can see that there's still life outside of the EU. Um, so uh, two uh, practical informations. We love inclusive innovations very much here in Norway. Uh, this is actually, it seems from the back of it, invented even by Swedes. So we are inclusive enough to feature this in our conference. And I understand that this is, an, like the cheese slicer, an invention that uh, has not uh, yet reached very far beyond Norway. So uh, <laughs> I, it seems to be a bit scary and might be more dangerous now than safe. But this is how you use it. <laughs> and now you are safe from being hit by cars, at least to a certain extent. So uh, in the dark Norwegian winter nights, if you plan to stay on for the rest of the weekend, this will help the cars to see you.